Everybody, it's me again, Patricia Windrow, sitting here at the Cable Easel with a program that you may be familiar with by this time, Painting and Drawing from Life. And um, this is the, um, uh, the season for painting out of doors and finding these wonderful landscapes. And I've been talking about going out with a video camera, which is what we do here at the studio, and shoot a scene for 25 or 30 minutes and then come back and play it on your VCR, and then you have all the comforts of your studio or home or kitchen or living room, and you can then have a wonderful learning tool. Uh, so I've decided to bring in a uh, home video sh a scene, uh, which uh, I shot uh, in, uh, in, in Virginia. Uh, the Shenandoah River is the, um, is the scene that you're going to be looking at, and um, it is uh, the valley, uh, well known by the name of Shenandoah, between the Blue Ridge Mountains and a range of mountains called the, the um, Massanutten Range. Uh, here it is, the, um, the river uh, which flows for 150 miles uh, from Waynesboro uh, to uh, north of Front Royal Virginia, which is where I live, and then it pours into the Potomac River. So anybody who has been wondering how they can go out and with their own video camera uh, take a scene. Here's the here's what it is. It is not the high quality which you will find from the uh, the professional cameras that we use here in the studio, but uh, it is nevertheless a uh, um, a perfectly acceptable uh, means of, of going out and shooting a scene. Now I've got this blank canvas as you can see. And I'm starting from scratch. And the layout, of course, is going to be exactly what I do here with the Long Island scenes. The only difference is instead of having a flat horizon, my horizon line is going to be mountains. So that's the, that is the one difference in pattern. Uh, and I, I think that it would, be, uh, it would be interesting to be able to just see how the approach is somewhat the same for uh, doing the mountain scene as it is for doing Long Island. It's just a difference in line. Uh, here's the way you, I've got one line going. There's the mountain line. That's the Blue Ridge Mountain. Um, then the land mass of trees that leads down to the river. And the river turns. Uh, uh, and here's the bend in the river. And of course, it begins to be foreshortened as it comes towards you. This is foreshortening when something becomes, when you see it at, at, at eye level. And here is the foreground, which is what I've been talking about for all this time. This is, of course, part one of two studies. Uh, the, the, uh, get as much as I can in the beginning and then continue on to somewhat detail later. The, uh, the horizon of the river uh, remains pretty flat at this point, even though it bul bulges out like so uh, for the, for the three-dimensional effect. Maybe it's a little bit in closer here. But there is the general feeling of how you lay out a painting, as I have done before. And then over here is another uh, line of trees uh, between the mountains and the river. And uh, behind these trees back here is the... Um, Stonewall Jackson Memorial Highway, which is where Mr. Jackson marched his troops north in order to supposedly win the Battle of Front Royal. Here are the trees uh, that are growing. <clears throat> they are aspen, some are birch, and a lot of them are, um, are um, sycamore. So these wonderful trees that are growing by the riverbank 
uh, are fed with this uh, fresh water. I swim in this, uh, in this river uh, very, very often during the summer, on a daily basis almost. And um, the, uh, the, the purity of the water is because it's continually moving. Uh, there is a great deal of fishing. In a little while, you will see uh, a flickering, spark, a sparkling light in the distance, uh, just about here. There's a canoe going to be coming around this bend and working its way down to the river. The river flows constantly, but rather slowly. However, it is the, um, it's the perfect way to keep a body of water clean by having continuously flowing water, as opposed to lakes, which, uh, which are uh, uh, somewhat uh, stagnant. Not all stagnant, but more stagnant than a river, that's for sure. So here we have a general layout, very much the same as what I do here on, on the Long Island scenes. And I did want to bring this in to show you that even, uh, I've been telling you about going out and doing this, and the best way to implement my suggestions is for me to show you uh, what can be done with your very own equipment. Um, the, uh, the little nooks and crannies of uh, the mountain scenes are similar also to what we have here on Long Island. The water is uh, always got reflections. It always, uh, many times and most of the time, reflects the blue of the sky. And so what we're dealing with here is um, to get some real mountains on some of these television programs as opposed to the ones that you see manufactured out of imagination for mountains that may or may not have ever existed. Uh, I, uh, I'm always amused when I see these uh, imaginary great mountain peaks rising on a canvas somewhere with no observation whatsoever and uh, the assumption that they do what they do, that the light always hits them on the, certain, the same side of the hill, uh, which of course, uh, if anybody has ever observed what happens to the lighting effects of a mountain, it is not that all the light comes on the same side. Uh, there's too much happening with the weather conditions and the clouds that cast, um, cast shadows across mountains for it to be, make any logic at all. I'm, I'm applying the, the sky color, which is extremely pale, uh, because that's what the monitor is. This was shot uh, two days ago on the edge of the Shenandoah River, and um, it was one of those remarkably warm, clear, uh, mistless days, uh, which everybody down there and everybody else is waiting for, and it's also the kind of weather that is making the apple orchards and the peach orchards, which are in trouble because of the winter, but they are trying desperately to bloom. The apples are fine, the peaches are in, uh, peaches are in trouble. Um, so, uh, as I was mentioning a little bit earlier to some, uh, some people about this river, this river is uh, very much uh, in the same kind of condition as certain parts of Long Island. It is uh, virtually unchanged since times going way back as far as you care to go. Um, because of the uh, because of the flooding, this river floods anywhere from one to seventeen feet above the normal water level. So you do not build docks, bulkheads, uh, little little uh, landing places for your boat unless you're perfectly prepared to have them uh, flooded out. And so the shore of this river is. Um, probably in exactly the same condition as it was in when uh, Indians, the Sharando Indians uh, who lived here, uh, paddled their birch bark canoes down the river. I'm now mixing some uh, Blue Ridge Mountain Color. Uh, it is, in fact, got the right name. This mountain range is, uh, is so blue at just about any time of the day. Light blue, dark blue, middle blue, royal, cobalt, ultramarine, the mountain is definitely blue. And so uh, that's one of the intriguing things about going down to these areas to find out that whoever named them was absolutely right. Um, the uh, the uh, quality of the atmosphere is different than it is here in a uh, on an island that is surrounded on on all sides by uh, an ocean. Uh, this is uh, this mountain range is um, uh, 60 miles or more from the ocean, but what it has is uh, interesting weather weather patterns because of what happens when cold fronts and warm fronts uh, meet the mountains. Uh, different things grow here and different looks uh, to the mountain take place uh, on a daily basis. Here the beach is pretty much what it looks like uh, a good deal of the time, but the mountains change and therefore they have a, a, a genuine mystery about them. The, um, 
the, uh, the, the wildlife is, of course, very similar. This is still North America. I'm not talking about Siberia or anything. So the wildlife is similar to what we know, but uh, there seems to be just more of it. Uh, it, it, um, it has not been compromised with enormous um, growth and development. So there are red-tailed hawks as a normal uh, site. Uh, down here, uh, they um, they are uh, strictly a North American bird, uh, as well as canaries were flying right overhead as we were shooting this scene. Uh, they were wild canaries, of course, but little yellow birds flying around in the mountains. Um, all very inspiring. This is also the uh, the Shenandoah Valley is the uh, migration route for the monarch butterfly on its way to Mexico. And uh, uh, the reason for that is that the milkweed uh, grows in profusion here, and that is the sustaining food for the monarch butterfly, as well as the place in which they rest and sometimes uh, um, lay their eggs. So uh, on, a, on a, any spring day, you will find that the... Um, and the valley is filled, literally filled, with tens of millions of monarch butterflies on their way south. Uh, here, as I'm talking to you, there, are, there is a way of interpreting the way these mountains uh, have their little valleys and things and uh, form, uh, form shadows. And I always do it uh, I I sort of in a minimal way uh, without, uh, without concentrating too much on, the, um, on these, uh, on these uh, shadowy places. But they have to be there so that the mountain doesn't look like it's just a cutout. And it's merely uh, very subtle and it has to be handled, but it must be there. Uh, you have to know that these mountains do this uh, in, the, in the shadows. Um, besides the butterflies uh, and the birds, uh, there are uh, uh, sycamores that line this uh, river, and they are the ones with the pale bark. Uh, they take a while to bloom, but they are ahead of up here. There is a great deal of, of blooming going on then, there at this time of year, and this is, this is in the uh, early spring. So uh, the pines are, of course, uh, famous uh, along the Skyline Drive, which is what the, uh, where, this, um, where this runs. Uh, if, uh, if, you, if you were to be able to suddenly just fly overhead, you would see that uh, along here is the Skyline Drive leading uh, for 130 miles down to Waynesboro, um, Virginia. The, um, the uh, tourist people uh, 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 talk about the Skyline Drive as being the ultimate uh, American uh, landmark as far as scenery is concerned. And with the exception possibly of some rather amazing places in the West, the Skyline Drive is, of course, uh, a product of the 30s, the late 30s. And uh, it's, um, it is really a scenic wonder. You feel almost as if you're flying when you're up in that drive. It is so high up, and, it, um, and, you, and the, uh, the falls down into the valley are so steep that you literally have a, a sort of a temporary feeling of, of flying, even though you're in your car. So it's a wonderful, it's, it's a wonderful drive to take. And um, there are nice spots along the way to stop good eating places. And of course, the deer and the bear are there uh, most of the year. You will find that, you find that um, uh, at any time of the year, you will find these uh, so-called so very exotic wildlife. There is deer, possum, bears, um, uh, uh, quail, pheasants, and uh, occasionally, very, very occasionally, there are mountain lions. Here is a uh, here is the uh, the indication that somewhere in the distance there is a pale blooming kind of uh, uh, little ridge of mountains uh, on which uh, the, uh, some ever evergreens are sort of peeking there. Where there evergreens are everywhere down here, uh, down in, in in Virginia, and they are the um, one of the national treasures. They are they make for wonderful landscape painting, but they also make for wonderful tourist attractions, and. Um, they uh, they are they sneak into your into your paintings and it's just wonderful what happens to them. Um, the um, uh, 
the uh, fact that uh, all of this wildlife uh, is existing down here is because, uh, fortunately, somehow, by some strange twist of fate, the uh, the development in this area has been kept somewhat at a minimum. It may be it may be very short lived. There may be some lots of things going to be happening, namely the Disney theme park uh, just a little bit uh, east of here is uh, is planning to come in, and that means uh, an, an enormous infusion of um, of people in, and trade and so on. So uh, there's some concern about it. Uh, when it's a done deal, there's nothing that anybody can do, but what one can do is to implement some some intelligent uh, rulings as to how you control the uh, apparently unbridled growth that takes place when something that enormous comes. Here is this um, Here's this land mass over here with very, uh, in my opinion, very exciting dark places, and I'll show you what I mean. Here is, the, here is where it becomes very dark because the shadows uh, have hit at this time of day. This is about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and the darkness of this, uh, of this um, bank of trees way over there as the river bends is what makes this, uh, some of these landscapes so, uh, uh, so very dramatic. And it's what made the um, American uh, school of uh, Hudson River painting and um, uh, Bierstadt uh, become such an incredible force in the American landscape painting was the drama of these scenes. And here, uh, here is a very uh, is a small example of the kind of uh, contrasts, enormous contrasts that you can get between uh, between mountains and uh, tremendous growths of of forest and woods and also uh, rivers. So here uh, is the um, here is the, the, the color scheme, which intrigues me when I'm down there. And I've painted many, many mountain scenes, and I'm happy to say that they sell rather well. And on that up note, uh, financial stability being what it is, let's take a break. For just a short moment, I need to squeeze some more paint, so I'll be right back. again uh, and I you know, it's very difficult to stop doing all sorts of doodling around while the break takes place but nevertheless I do attempt to, to do that here I am on this nice wonderful shadow side of this um, of this side of the river which is the uh, west side of the Shenandoah as it flows north the Shenandoah River flows uh, towards uh, the Potomac, which is north of here, and um, it's a, it is. There's been a lovely book written by a, a rather remarkable lady writer called Julia Davis, and it's called *The Shenandoah: All the History of This Short but Very Dramatic and Very Important River*. It, it carried uh, a great deal of. Um, of uh, supplies and everything during both of the major American wars, and um, it is uh, it has remained a supply route for uh, over a period of a, a very long period of time. So. 
uh, the uh, the uh, the writing about this river is pr pretty natural, and, and I believe it's in any it's in, it's in any library. It was also uh, a vital source of uh, communication during the Civil War as well as during the Revolutionary War, because under cover of darkness, you can in fact get genuinely lost in a um, in a river such as this. Uh, there are periodically they find uh, they find uh, remnants of encampments along the river, of course, because there's water and and water is vital during any kind of a wartime operation. Here we have, uh, this is obviously part one of uh, doing this in two parts. And uh, I, I work from the furthest place away to the foreground. So I'm working naturally with the, with the distant, distant shots. Um, when the river, uh, when the river um, floods, of course, it becomes uh, dangerous, impassable, and uh, that's why it has not been changed. Uh, people uh, do put up pressure-treated um, bulkheads and little places to launch their canoes, but they uh, bank on the idea, no pun intended, uh, that the, the thing is going to flood eventually very severely. Uh, the, um, the, the, there's another thing that happens in this river because it seems to be still very clean at this point. Um, uh, further north, the river was rather severely polluted by a plant that manufactured uh, fake uh, fabrics, synthetic fabrics, and it was in Front Royal, as a matter of fact, but that has been closed down now. And the, um, the river is a, an unhappy river uh, uh, just uh, beyond that site of where that chemical plant used to be, but here it is uh, pure enough to be able to find all kinds of, there are, there are so freshwater turtles, freshwater frogs, sna freshwater snakes, quite beautiful things. And uh, what I'm doing now is introducing the um, the, the high reflection against the background of that dark uh, uh, foresty place here. Just beyond here, a little bit to my right, is a farm in which uh, all summer long, great uh, herds of uh, Hereford cows, the brown and white fellows, fellows, ladies, who um, that, uh, that walk, go down to the river for drinks. And, um, it's a it's it's a it's a lovely feeling when you see the uh, the presence of of uh, the of the cattle uh, by the river uh, doing what uh, you see in uh, paintings that have been around for uh, centuries, uh, specifically America. I mean English paintings of the English countryside where the herds of cattle are wallowing in the water uh, of a river or a pond. Anyway, here is the um, here is where this this sort of brilliant uh, area ends. And now what gets picked up is the uh, is the extremely dark and dramatic reflections of this uh, of this great uh, darkened uh, shadowy place, and um, the uh, the uh, colors are extremely uh, mysterious, and they are so dark that you uh, sort of question whether or not uh, anything reflected in the river can be that dark. So let me let me just demonstrate how. E if it occurred to anybody that these reflections are too dark, I think that you will agree that, uh, that it works anyway. And that's why the use of a video camera uh, for, uh, as a learning tool, which is, why I, which is why I brought this in, for you to be able to see what I've been talking about, that you can, in fact, do this of your, on, on, your, on your own. You do not have to uh, think that it is um, exclusive to the cable easel and, uh, and this uh, studio to go out and take these shots because everybody's got the fast forward and the and the and the delay and the stop uh, motion on their v VCRs and that's essential for doing this because you're go you're going to be working with um, some details that are so fleeting when you're out there that to be able to stop it i mean the 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 early american painters never had this advantage here is the way um, uh, with deliberate strokes i have watched other programs talking about uh, water reflections whereby some somebody goes with a with a brush full of paint and they pull it down and they say, ah, oh, that looks uh, pretty much like a reflection. Well, what I'm interested in is that it looks exactly like a reflection. And 
That can be done only with the deliberate strokes and the intense observation of what is happening out there. The, um, one of the reasons that I wanted to shoot this scene, and my son Adam assisted uh, me, I assisted, I assisted him, I actually just simply peered into the viewfinder and he's the one that uh, operated the mechanism because um, I'm, I'm an absolute klutz as far as that's concerned. I really don't understand much of it. So uh, he, he, he was the, the one that was extremely helpful in, in doing this. Um, the uh, the need to uh, the need to uh, find the right weather conditions. Of course, we went down once before, and it got dark, and the clouds came over, and everything turned turned gray and and unusable. So it's always wise to find to find the right weather conditions to do this, and to be sure that this is the scene that you are really anxious to reproduce. Here is uh, here is the uh, the beginning of an amazing thing that took place, and that's why I wanted this scene. That this water area here has turned the color of the land. There's virtually no blue in this area of the river, and uh, you have to believe what you see. So on, on that basis, uh, with a brush full of uh, what I would call land color, I'm going to begin to paint in the uh, in the uh, water area, which is brown and green and yellow ochre, and no sign of blue whatsoever. Whatsoever. So let's see if I can see if I, let's see if I can uh, sort of pull this off, as it were, and uh, and and reproduce what it was that made me really interested in this scene. Uh, the reflections are, of course, always uh, in, intriguing to me, and I've been doing them for a very long time. But something happens with this river, and as you look at the monitor, you'll see that the river is continually flowing, rather slowly, but it is nevertheless a constant flow, and naturally, and. Um, as the as the uh, as the uh, reflections uh, remain fairly constant because of the time of day, the sun was setting over behind behind us, uh, and um, the uh, the presence of uh, dramatic shadows was beginning to take place on the mountain. Uh, in front of us, as well as the mountain behind us. The mountain behind us is um, is one of the longest single mountain ranges in uh, in the country. It is 50 miles long, one single huge boulder of a mountain, uh, and that's uh, that's called the Massanutten. That's an Indian word, uh, the meaning of which escapes me at this present time. But I'll be I'll, I'll probably be able to um, tell you the next time. But uh, the um, see see the the deep uh, the deep brown that is taking place here is. Um, is one of the intriguing things about the uh, about the business of observing all of this stuff uh, as it happens in front of you. Uh, there is nobody in my in my uh, uh, acquaintance of painters that would have been able to um, memorize or even record this. Uh, in their memory without being uh, using some reference material. And so I find that I can't repeat it often enough that it is the deliberate strokes that is going to make a painterly quality, but it is also the intense observation of what is happening out there. There is a little bit of purple in this, in this tone down here. It is uh, close to the shoreline, and it is also extremely uh, extremely dense in the way of dramatic color. There is a uh, there is a, a streak of bright yellow that runs across very much like this, and that's picking something up from above. It's uh, there's another one. Uh, there's one just a little bit higher up, and one well, not enough yellow. One stroke should do it. However, if the if this is not entirely acceptable, you go back to it and you revise it later. Well, this half hour seems to have gone. Uh, I, I believe that uh, this is now time to say that uh, tune in the next time for me to resolve and finalize this uh, study of the Shenandoah River with a home video camera. I hope that it was helpful to you and that it will encourage you to go out and do the same thing. So, uh, hoping that you watch the next time. Bye bye.
Oh boy, this is absolutely perfect. Well, it's just about the center of the frame now. They are at the, at the center line. We've got uh, 25 minutes. How close do you want? Hmm? How close do you want? Pretty close. I mean, they're going to go out of the picture. I know. Well, how long should I get them? You can keep following them? Yeah, we can keep following them all the way down the river, but Is it, it won't... going to be um, jiggly? No. I'm keeping them in the middle of the shot. I mean, it's not going to do be five minutes of a thing. Hey.